I'm live. Look at that. Look what we're doing today. I almost didn't do this, and then I thought, I want to get it in in August, so let's go for it. Today, I'm going to be doing a live standalone book review. So this is a series, and I didn't want to stumble on step two. Today, we're going to be reviewing The Women of the Copper Country by Maria Doria Russell. And, surprise, surprise, this was my first instant five-star read of the year. And yes, it is August 31st, so it's taken that long. I think a lot of other books were really good, really precise, really well-crafted, but they didn't hit me with enough impact to be like, oh, you know, feel that, oof, like, crater impact. So when I read this earlier this month, I was sure that I wanted to do a standalone review. And so here I am to do it just under the wire. Um, I've got notes. Let's see. What should I say? I usually start out by saying, how did I get this book? So that if you're like me, you know whether or not you're in the same situation. This is a historical fiction book that was recommended to me when I was going to the Historical Novel Society conference in June. And it sounded like something that was similar to what I was writing. Hey, Brian. I can't pop things up because I'm not in StreamYard. I'm in, in YouTube Live. So I'll just say, hey. Um, thanks for stopping by. How's your how's your writing going? Um, I don't know if you know about comps and, and nonfiction. I guess you would have them too. But that process is finding books that are like yours in some significant way so that you can use them to compare and describe to give a pe to give people an idea what they'd be getting. Like this is, you know, Harry Potter meets The Walking Dead or this is uh, the Hunger Games meets, I, I don't know, um, what's on my shelf? <laughs> it's all the nonfiction, The Secret River. There you go. So it's like taking books and, and giving a taste to the reader to see if they would want to get them. So that's why I picked this one up. I thought, oh, labor struggle, early 20th century, um, women activists, and in Michigan, Upper Peninsula of Michigan, the UP. And so I thought, oh, perfect. And I wasn't expecting it to be so, so much of a tractor pull on the emotions, but this is the first time I've read Maria Doria Russell. So I am very pleased to be able to go back and read some of her backlist. She's got like six or seven other books. And um, this is from 2019. I think she might have another book out, but either way, this is the first one I've read of her, which is very exciting. She is a biological anthropologist in Ohio. And uh, so she brings, I don't know what kind of background that brings to writing. Anthropology is looking at the past, excavating details, sifting fact from fiction. That probably helps with historical fiction. Um, and I gave you a little bit of a sketch of the plot. Um, my writing is editing and editing stinks. Yes, there are comps in nonfiction. Publishers usually want to know what books your book proposal is similar to. Oh, okay. So you have to do comps for a book proposal. <laughs> oh, man. That sounds painful. That sounds really painful. Um, so why did I like this book so much? Why is it my first five-star read of 2021? Well, the emotional punch, definitely. I've got some comments based on the other blurbs, and you'll be interested to know perhaps that one of the blurbs in the front of the book where they have like, you know, a, cup, a page or two of trade quotes, uh, trade praise, is from an open letters review that is written by none other than a book olive, booktuber extraordinaire. So I was very excited to see that. I went to see the review, saw it was by Olive Fellows, and it said she's a booktuber. And I went, oh, this is the Olive. So that was pretty exciting. She found a couple things she didn't um, appreciate about this, but let me get one of them out of the way. So there's lots of like trimmings around this um, book. Not a lot, but there's a few things that stood out to me at the beginning. Um, there's a quote. Let me read the quote to you at the beginning. It's not a dedication. I'm sure there's a name for what this is, but um, it's before the prologue. It's, not. it's called The Laborer. 
it says, the laborer is worthy of his wage, Matthew 10, 10. So it's a Bible quote, and it's the quotation that she chose to set off the whole book, which I found interesting. Really puts you in the mood for like the epic battle. Then there's a prologue. I, I'm sure people have very strong feelings about prologues. And then there's these quotes at the beginning, which are single lines from Romeo and Juliet. And I was just watching an interview with her with a book club in Michigan, where she explains how it really fit together. And that was one of my questions. It's in the book club discussion. Uh, I had a question about it. There were a couple things that pinged comparisons with Romeo and Juliet. But in the book club discussion, she really says like all these parallels made it very, very compelling. And so it just seemed to jump out at her. And so she thought she'd draw the reader's eye to that. So if you know the story of Romeo and Juliet, two houses, both alike in dignity, where we set our fair scene in Verona or something like that. In Verona? In Messina? I don't know. One of those, one of those Italian cities. And uh, the two houses that she's addressing in this historical novel are the town of laborers versus the house of the manager of the mine. And so, whee, okay. Brian says what he's working on now will have a lot of comps. Interesting. <laughs> the one here, put it in, put it in. Um, if you, if this sounds interesting to you, you might like my next book then. Um, so parallels with Romeo and Juliet from the labor and the capital and, um, just random tangent. I just started listening to good economics for hard times, bad times, hard times from Banerjee and Duflo who are famous economists, development economists, which is what I used to study. And I thought, Oh, they have an audio book about this. This should be interesting hearing them talk about it for a lay audience rather than reading scholarly articles. And uh, yes, one of the things they talk about is immigration policy vis-a-vis -vis actual supply and demand and economics and why it doesn't, it doesn't work the way that many people think it does. So I was just listening to that this morning going, oh yes, gleeful, gleeful, peel the layers back. Tell me how everyone doesn't understand economics because that I will believe. Um, all right, prologue, chapter quotes. So there's trimmings. There's things uh, on the beginning of this book that um, sort of separate you. But then you dive right in. You dive right in with um, a point of view character called Annie Clements, who is a real person. And she's a very tall uh, Slovenian daughter of immigrants. And she lives in a company town. If you know what a company town is, uh, I don't need to explain it, but if you don't, um, it's a it's a arrangement when you had a very capital intensive industry where the capital owners would pay for the housing and infrastructure of a place because um, they needed to to attract the labor. So it was sort of like the give and take was higher for this rather than other kinds of industries. So for a copper mine, which is what we're talking about with a copper country, that's what that means. There was a lot of um, capital investment. Anyway, we're getting very economical in this discussion. I want to veer away from that. Just slap me on the wrist. Um, I skip sometimes prologues if they aren't numbered like the rest of the book. Yeah. And especially especially with like epic novels that are really long when you look at a prologue and you're like, I don't know, is this going to spoil it for me? Is this going to be like reading the back of the book with those tricksters? Um, this one does not. This one sets the scene with our main point of view character several years before to give us a view of where she came from and why we start at a certain very tense point. So we start at the very beginning, the morning of a death that is the inciting incident for the strike. And it's all about the strike. So we get to hear about Annie Clemens. We get to hear about secondary characters, um, Polish immigrant, Finnish immigrant, the manager who's Scottish, and uh, a press a reporter, journalist, who is Irish. And so we have this big crowd of immigrant experiences that we get to learn from and see the conflict from, which is part of the strength. 
Um, clever use of labor and capital as the names of the towns and families. I like labor novels. Labor and capital as the names of the towns. So the name of the town is Calumet. That's the name of the mine. Um, but I'm not sure what you mean there. But it could be something different. Um, yeah, all the immigration uh, experiences that are put into the novel is part of the reason why I love it. The setting. So I didn't know anything about Copper Country when I read this book until I read where it was set, which is the Upper Peninsula. And I grew up knowing that my grandpa was a youper, a, a UPer, is how, how they call themselves. And um, he did not live in a mine town. He lived in Flint when my dad was born um, and came from Marquette. So Marquette is like closer to civilization than Calumet. So I think he may have known people or known of the situation, but not been involved in it, you know. But that was interesting for me to learn a little bit about the, the area where my family came from. Um... And who else do we have who's real? So Annie Clements was real. We also see Mother Jones. I just thought it was a newspaper name. Joke's on me. Mother Jones is, um, at this point in 1913, a very old, uh, old hand and also older woman who travels to support labor strikes and struggles across the country. She's famous for, I think, um, the... It wasn't copper, silver mines in Colorado, maybe. And so she makes an appearance because she actually came to this place. And also someone called Ella Bluer. And I didn't know about her. And she's from, well, she comes to the scene from somewhere in New England. So you get the feeling that this is important in this time in history. It's 1913. And you've got big names coming from other places to help the people here in this tiny little township that is not theirs. It's owned by the company in the back of the beyond between the United States and Canada, basically, and help them in the struggle. And it, it follows a pretty predictable path in terms of how they cheat and how they try to survive and, you know, sort of the cat and mouse games of starving people out and ordering them not to do business. But you get a lot a closer look at the relationships and how they frayed. So if you're thinking it gets like, I don't know, what am I thinking of? If you're thinking of a rope over a corner of something and it gets pulled back and forth and pulled back and forth and eventually it starts fraying. And that's what it feels like we're witnessing in real time is these relationships that get stressed and stressed and stressed um, by the strike. And um. It was very intense and very beautiful how Maria Doria Russell portrays where these women who are leading the emotional effort of the strike find their strength. So there's that. There's the historical detail. There's the emotional impact. There's the like real, you know, um, pathos of the strike. And then there's the scenes I'm going to start going through. So I, I do this thing and people may hate it. I turn down the corner of the top of the pages when I really like something and the bottom when I don't. So I, uh, I'm not one of these pristine book people. Sorry, sorry, sorry. But I want to go through the things that jumped out at me as positives and sort of explain. Um, the first one, page 22, it juxtaposes a 14 year old. Here's one of the Romeo and Juliet references falling in love, sort of puppy love with the realities of her mentors. Annie's marriage um, reality in this very stressful situation. And so right at the beginning, you're already being set up to analyze whose point of view are you in and um, the truth will shift over time kind of feeling. So that was great. Page 111, there's an inner monologue of thinking through the enemy strategy. So classic, okay, this is where I divulge that I also liked another strike story called Newsies, <laughs> which was turned into a Disney musical and they changed history so that they won. There's a bunch of boys singing and dancing in New York City. I mean, how can you not love that? But 
this is like one of the things I learned in a different story that um, you have to think through what the enemy, what the house on the other side is going to be um, planning to do to you and sort of anticipate that. It's like war, basically. And it's actually, it recalls something that I put in one of my books, which is the timing of an eviction is very, can be very strategic if you do it right as all the garden produce is supposed to be coming ripe so that they can't harvest that food. You've put them out on the road with no winter stores and you need cash instead of, you know, seeds to sustain yourself. And so you're put at a big disadvantage. So I just like that thought. Oh, I did that too. <laughs> um, page 135. There is a very deft explanation of a Jesuit joke, which I just appreciated coming from a Jesuit Catholic education background. I thought that was funny. Um, and that's one of the push and pulls of uh, writing in a way that is inclusive, where if you have details that maybe you knew or you learned in your research and you want to tell them to people, but you don't want to be weird about it and like explain everything and be a, have an info dump, what you have to do is put it in the text in a way that makes it sound natural for the characters, but that has a wink to the author, sorry, a wink to the reader about what it actually means so that people just don't feel lost and like it's over their head. So that was a very good one. I liked that a lot. Uh, page 211, we jump into Eva, the 14 year old POV again, and you see her growing up and it's like a, such a stark turning point when she sort of lets go of the, childishness in her because she's starting to see all these adults and how they behave as adults in this hard time. And so that was beautiful. Page 216, Ella Bloor's uh, contemporary quotes. Oh yes. Okay. So here's a really, here's another really cool thing about um, research. So if you are going to research 1913, for example, you can look up contemporary novels. What are people reading? What was in vogue in the last 10 years, et cetera. But in that period, you're going to have a variety of references, right? So right now people still make references to stuff that happened in the eighties. That's 40 years ago. So getting a real sense of that cultural consciousness of that time period is super hard. And she puts this quote in from one of the labor leaders who's real that she really liked Percy by Shelley. She quotes his poem that is based on the Peterloo massacre, which is like in 1810 or 20 or 30. So it's like almost a century earlier. And that's another, um, it's a, it's a British actually, a s event in history in Britain where a lot of people thought that there was an injustice being done. And so they came to, demonstrate and they were put down by police and lots of people died and it was horrible. But having that sort of from the event to the poem to the rousing words of a labor leader, it was just like seeing that historical legacy was so good. So I thought that was really good. Um, okay. Here's a poll. Here's the first negative thing I, that I caught. I'm pretty sure there's one of the reasons I will never write good fiction. I'm an info dumper. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. We all, we all do it. It's called the first draft. And then you get people to tell you, I was overwhelmed. No worries. So the poll question is, how many people know what Sisu is? S-I-S-U. Maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. Sisu. Sisu. Just put that out there. Um, we see it first on page 29, very early on. We see it again on page 37 no explanation. And then like halfway down the page, we finally get the explanation. And I was like, way wrong. You know how you go along and you see a word you don't know and it's in it italics and you think, oh, well, maybe it means this. And then the next time you see it, you're like, I still have no confirmation. <laughs> and so you wait until they actually explain it. Um, and I was, I was way off. I didn't know what this meant. It's a cultural background term for Finns. And it's like the stoicism of, um, is it bereavement? Not showing emotion, basically. Hey, Leo. Nice to see you here. 
Yeah. So I learned a Finnish term in this, you know, random <laughs> historical fiction book about the upper peninsula of Michigan. Um, so this is braiding together Slovenian, Polish, Finnish, all these different immigrant backgrounds in such a beautiful way. But, you know, I, I don't like being on the hook and not knowing what something means. So it took two and a half times for me to get the, the significance of the word. And, um, and then it was fine. Um, okay. Page 212. So people in cold climates, I don't know, probably not Texas, probably not Portland. <laughs> Leah waved back. Um, people in cold climates, if you're watching this later, let me know. Uh, she mentions the holes dug in autumn in the cemetery. So I can see the need to make holes in the ground in the cemetery before the ground freezes, because then you can't bury people and you have no cold storage for the bodies. But how did you keep snow from going in the holes and like filling it up? And I, I, I kept trying to think through this going, well, if you put something on top of it, the snow is going to be 20 feet deep. It's going to break. Like, is it just water? Is it going to drain into the soil? So I got way off tangent with that one. <laughs> so if anyone can help me out and, and JD's here. Hello. Hello. Late as ever. Um, he's in Atlanta. So he's not going to be able to help me with this cold weather question. I'm going to have to wait for Sandy to come on who actually lives in Michigan. Tell me, tell me what the deal is. How do you keep snow out of an open grave? That is the question of the day. And that's all I had for negative things. So as you can see, that the positive one over the negative here. And if anyone else has that system, let me know because, you know, we're, we're on the same page here. Last few notes, and then I'm going to give a pointer to Christy Stratos's live that's happening at 5 o'clock in 15 minutes. Um, so the last few notes for the women of the Copper Country are what I saw, um, Olive, because this is reviewed by a book, Olive, and Open Letters Review. She talks about the dialogue and the body language that Maria Doria Russell uses as two of her strengths. And not having read some of her other books, I can't generalize. But are y'all a fan of dialogue? Is it hard to write? Like for me, for me, dialogue is pretty easy to write because I'm writing and I'm hearing people say the things. And it's not like I'm trying to craft something very exact. Um, Although check with check back with me in a little bit and I may have changed my mind. So dialogue, I think, is is pretty easy. And this one flows just like I was hearing the voices in my head in my own book. It's very true to the period. It's very peppered with different people's immigrants' languages. It's very rich. And so it's not dumbed down. And so I really appreciated that. <laughs> JD says. Arrive for the burying tips. Yes, cold weather. Why would you dig holes in the autumn if you are gonna fill up a grave with snow? It's you can go back. It's fine. Uh, he is a tropical fish, so no clue. No dialogue often drives many scenes for me. Yeah, yeah. So dialogue A plus, and then body language. Yes. Okay. So if I if I wanted to be cheeky, I would like hold up the the Sarah J. Moss that I have right below this computer and compare it. Because the body language is so repetitive in Sarah J. Moss. And I'm sorry, Lady Jane, if you're watching this. It's a great fantasy romance, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't explore the whole range, right? You're either bored or devastated, or um I can't remember what the third one was. I, I was coming up with like a theory of Sarah J. Moss. And that is not women of copper country at all. Um, the body language feels so true. It feels like it feels like Maria Doria Russell does what Maisie Dobbs does. She's a fictional character. Don't worry. Um, but like embodies the position that she's describing to see how it makes her feel to see if that's the right feeling. Do you know what I mean? So it's like reverse engineering what you should use to describe the scene. And I found that really cool. So a plus again, um, Leo says, I definitely need to work on making my dialogue better. Hey, Hey, Hey. Um, I don't know how to do that. How do you, how would you make dialogue better? Say it out loud probably because as soon as you say something out loud and realize how unnatural it seems, it'll, it'll click into, Oh, okay. It's, it's too much subject or it's too much slang or it's too long or it's too 
complex or whatever. Yeah, if you haven't if you haven't read your novel out loud to yourself, where are you at? No, that was ridiculous. Sorry, strike that from the record. Um, so that was one thing, and then two more that I got from the reviews, the quotes, the review quotes. Um, good tip, excellent. That's one, and also people watch and see how they talk. Yeah. Although I don't know, I don't know how many recordings you would get from 1913 listening. They'd sound pretty weird on wax, wax recordings, but. Um, from the Manhattan Book Review, it talked about sentimentality. And this is a very interesting one for me because when I try to describe something as sentimental, it's, it's from the angle of like nostalgia, right? Sentimental means you're sweetening something and making it more idealized than it would have been or sentimental, a sentimental novel. It's a Victorian novel thing, actually, a sentimental novel. It's actually like a literary term, and I forget what it means. But for for modern fiction, that's what I would associate it with. But that's not like the that's not the meaning of the word. That's the word when you apply it to books. And is this just me? I mean, tell me if I'm crazy, but I, I think I think it's different. The quote is quote is. Um, the heavy emotions are handled carefully, creating a story that is beautifully told and not overcome by sentimentality. So what do they mean by not overcome by sentimentality? I, I, I don't know. Hit me with what you think about this word and whether I've got the right read on it. The historical challenges. Yeah. Um, so that left me wondering, and I'm going to be thinking about the sentimentality quote. And then the last one <laughs> is the review quote on the front which is from Kirkus Review saying historical fiction that feels uncomfortably relevant today. And I just have to say that's like the understatement of the year. The book club discussion that I was watching before this um, had the author on. It was great. And she said she finished this the week before the 2016 election. And so she had to rewrite the ending <laughs> because she didn't want to end it on such a sad note. And she didn't want to... Well, anyway, no spoilers, um, but uncomfortably relevant. I feel like it's the exact sort of oppositional space we're in right now and the desperation space and the denying people humanity space. Like there's so many parallels. I don't get as excited about the Romeo and Juliet parallels. Like for me and my writing, especially, I get excited with the parallels with present day and how it'll make people like maybe act differently. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that was that was the the crowning glory is that it came out when we've been in this contracted period of decline and greed and all this stuff and how. Um, it shows the generosity of people, the struggle of people, the adapting and fighting that people will do for survival, which ultimately is very hopeful. So, so that is my standalone review for The Women of the Copper Country by Maria Doria Russell. Yay! Five star, first of the year. You should definitely read it and, you know, tell me if you disagree or if this doesn't sound like you at all, but I, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, what a fuckness. What? <laughs> You're going to have to explain that made up word. The only thing I wanted to do left, let's see, in case you want to buy it, I put the bookshop link down there so you can support indies instead of the Zon. But the other thing I was going to point out was if you are hanging out looking for something to watch online, I've got a link for you. And I haven't been putting links up because I've been concentrating. And I'm sure it's not going to be evident in the replay because it's going to feel like a scatter shot of, of randomness. That's okay. Um, the link I'm putting in there is Christy Stratos and Richard, Richard Stevens uh, live that is going on in 10 minutes over on Facebook. Um, they feature indie authors and it's called Lurking for Legends. Could this be the next legendary author? And I am always missing it by like a hair's breadth. And so today I saw it on Instagram and I put it in my head and I thought I'm going to be there. So um, 
adding to my TBR and probably also gifting to my mom. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I'm here for it. Um, so yeah, go uh, check out Christy and Richard. They have someone who, who is a poet, Alexandria Goodall, today. Um, and that's all I have for you today. Standalone book review, Tuesday video. I, I, I almost missed it, but someone guilted me. Someone guilted me into doing a video today. So thanks, John. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming by. Uh, love you, beautiful people. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Don't forget to taste live twice. Like, subscribe, all that nonsense. And uh, have a lovely evening. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.